Uh, thank you all for joining us here in this Zoom webinar. Uh, my name is Kevin Brown. I'm the Director of Development for the Child Burn Foundation. And I'm thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Azezabor, a leading expert in burn care and a valued partner of the Children's Burn Foundation. Uh, Dr. Azezabor's groundbreaking work in Lagos, Nigeria, addresses some of the most severe, complex burn cases we encounter, particularly in regions with limited resources. Our partnership with Dr. Azezabor is instrumental in providing life-saving care to children across Africa. I'm excited to explore how this collaboration is making profound impact on the lives of these children and their families. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Azezabor. Um, I just have a few questions for you today. Um, starting with, I know you originally were trained and are a plastic surgeon. Can you tell us a little bit about how your background and how you ended up uh, getting involved with uh, burn survivors and working with children? Well, um, yes, as you rightly said, I trained as a plastic surgeon at the National Orthopedic Hospital in Lagos after my medical school at the University of Benin, uh, Benin City. But um, thereafter, I um, got a fellowship with the, uh, that is the British Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgeons um, sponsored my fellowship to Birmingham Children's Hospital uh, to be trained in pediatric bands. And since then I've been practicing pediatric bands until, that was in 2010 when I went for that fellowship. And then I was practicing pediatric bands as part of my other practices uh, practice until uh, 2016, when um, I had where I started my collaboration with Children Bones Foundation through International Society for Burns Injury. We met in uh, Florida, and um, that was where um, I was brought into Children Burns Foundation to help with the Africa, um, that is the Africa outreach. And um, we've been on since then. Okay. That was it. Okay. So I'm curious, you had spoken earlier at uh, one of the meetings here at the Children's Burn Foundation. You were saying there are some very skilled plastic surgeons who don't want to work with burn survivors or... Uh, can you elaborate a little on why someone trained in plastic surgery would say, I, I have these skills, but I don't want to work with, with burn patients? Um, well, most plastic surgeons, you know, you train as a general plastic surgeon, then you can decide to choose which subspecialty you want, you're so interested in. You could do autoplastic, you, do, you could do hand surgery, you could do uh, just flap surgery, microvascular surgery. You could do uh, burn surgery, that is, uh, as a burn specialist, um, then cosmetic. You know, cosmetic is so lucrative and everybody wants to go cosmetic. Now, um, burns has a lot of uh, burden with it in the sense that um, the outcome, that is one, the resources that is spent to, it's going to take your time, three, um, the finances, especially when you're working in the um, low resource environment. Mm -hmm. So the patient not able to afford uh, the cost of um, getting treatment um, can be a very, very big factor and can also contribute to the mortality that someone gets in the hospital. And also the long time they spend in the hospital, um, and during that time you had passed. Then when you now have two, three, four of such patients that is tasking you um, all through. So most people will prefer that, okay, they do a specialty that they could have some time before they get burned out. Mm -hmm. So they just are interested in other specialty Majority would not like to go for burns, and that is it. So for people to go for burns, you have to go encourage them, 
they have to be trained properly and um, they must also be psychologically ready and um, also be ready to sacrifice their time for this patient and very few if we decide to take a sense of, of even normal people i mean i, I said normal not, not normal ordinary people mm -hmm. ordinary people they will tell you okay choose between the subspecialty in plastic surgery i'm sure majority of them would not want to um choose ban you understand yeah. now that if we add the fact that we are dealing with children here taking care of children is not also easy now you combine burn which is a burden with taking care of children which is another burden then you know that we are really we are really cut out for a very big job sure and that is it so mm -hmm. thank you so uh for those that aren't familiar with burn injuries and when an adult is burned, you would do the repair of the skin over a course bit of a time. But for a child, since they're growing, you have to go back and repeatedly do that. Can you elaborate a little on that and why children are different than adults in terms of burn care? Yeah, that's true. Apart from, you know, first of all, when someone gets burned, the first thing is to keep them alive. And that is really tasking. So with every team on board. Like in Africa, you might you might not even have all the team. You, the plastic surgeon, could, will be the intensivist, the uh, therapist, mm -hmm. and um, even the pediatrician. So you just have to be vast at so many things to keep this child alive. Mm -hmm. so I'm talking about child because we're talking about Children Burns Foundation. Yes, yeah. they treat adults. Yeah. And after the survive, the survivor, you'll be thinking of how you going on, that is with the fluid resuscitation, um, oxygen resuscitation, make sure their airway is okay mm -hmm. and they are stable. You now be talking about removing the dead skin if it is full thickness burn or very deep burn. So that is another body. And you have to get blood, you have to get everything ready because it's really a very tasking surgery. And uh, the stress on the patient is much. And uh, after doing that, you now think of reconstruction. Now you're not just uh, thinking of reconstruction in terms of uh, just covering with skin. Remember some of them have some important features in the body that are burned. And these are features of recognition, especially when it comes to face. You want to reconstruct the eyelids, the nose, the leaf, the ear, the, in fact, the scalp everywhere, neck and all. And these features have to be reconstructed in a way that at least there should be some semblance, the resemblance of who got burned. So mm -hmm. the skin you use and all. Then the burden of getting skin, especially when in children, especially when um, they have a major percentage bonds. And um, you know, you know, in Africa, we don't have uh, the luxury of um, that technology of regenerative medicine where we have to go culture skin and all. We don't have a DAMA template like the Integra uh, for us to create the dermis and all but you just have to find your way around this so that you can reduce uh, um, the, the disfigurement mm -hmm. that might arise after reconstruction of this patient. So it's really tasking going mm -hmm. through those process and knowing that you don't have the resources in terms of finances, the human resources, even your patients, even if you have the human resources, your patients itself is a resources. That means right. you, if you if you must have that patient to take care of, I mean, you must have that patient to take care of those children mm -hmm. up to what is acceptable. And remember that um, when you're working on those children, you must work with the aim of them returning back to the society. Mm -hmm. 
them returning back to the society without stigma mm -hmm. should be your aim without um, psychological um how will i put it psychological defect mm -hmm. so yeah. that they'll be able to interact with the environment very well mm -hmm. and it's not only that the environment also should be ready for these children to come back, meaning that you have to educate the children they are going to meet in school. You have to educate the people around the home that this person is going to look different mm -hmm. and um, how you make sure stigma, stigmatization don't uh, come in for the child. Those are the things. So after the reconstruction of this child, after going through the previous processes and reconstruction is gone, is done, you must rehabilitate the patient. Your rehabilitation starts from the beginning, from the time the patient is coming in, but we start planning how the environment is going to be. A lot of time, the patients that we see go back into poverty, you know, patient was not able to attend school, the parents are poor, the parents not educated to know the importance of education. But through Children's Bones Foundation, uh, I will say majority of these children that we have treated, our aim is to get them back into the society and also make sure they go to school. Like I will always follow them, follow their education and ask them, where are you? What are you doing now? And they will send me the results. Just a testimony to say they are going to school. In some occasion, I just want to talk to the teachers. Mm -hmm. If they're going to school, I want to talk to the teacher. How is he doing in school? Why is he coping? How are you making sure that this child is not stigmatized? Is he psychologically okay in school? Socially accepted and all? So all those things have to be factored because it is not just the skin. Yeah. It is the defect, uh, the disfigurement in terms of the psychological disfigurement, the social disfigurement. Let me put it that way, if you allow me to use that um, English yeah. word, that is far, far more important than the physical skin dis disfigurement after you've taken care of function and um, if we are able to do that, most of the time, the children cope very well. Mm -hmm. They cope very, very well. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about your partnership with the Children's Burn Foundation and how it may have enhanced uh, your ability to support families, particularly those in rural areas? Yeah. How it has been able to support many families. I've been able to see a lot of people from the very deep rural area be mobilized to come to the hospital when they have this burn. Normally before they go to the traditional doctor that use cow dung as a cow, means of dress. Cow dung? Cow dung, yes. On the, on the wound? On the wound. On the wound. Okay. So they, they, they use that to treat, they use urine, they use different um, kind of things to uh, treat these burns. And uh, at the end of the day, some of them that, were, that are rescued are rescued into the hospital in a very toxic state. Imagine. That is yeah. serious, severe infection. Yeah. And remember most of these uh, traditional practitioners um, they're there for business, you know, and at the end of the day, deceiving, there was no formal training. Mm -hmm. So now, what we discover is that the reason, the, the reason why they do that is because they cannot afford the orthodox medical practice mm -hmm. and medical uh, centers. Yeah, And so, that is the only way where they could go. And a situation where most African countries, um, health is paid for out of the pocket. Mm. 
there's no organized health insurance. I can give you an example in a place like Nigeria, we have health insurance, but it does not cover plastic surgery. It is written in that book, it does not cover plastic surgery at all. And we're still trying to fight that if it could cover plastic surgery. But most of these people who are coming from this very rural area are not covered by health insurance because they are so poor, they can't contribute to the health insurance. Sure. So they yeah. get nothing at all. Mm -hmm. But if they are able to see where to go to and get this treatment, the financial sorted out, then they will come. They will definitely come. The only thing is that the parent come begging, come, we are going to dub this child here, help us to treat the child, and they are not ready to put any financial support yeah. into it, and they see that you can do that, they will come. And that's what we've been able to do. So I can say, then when we started, our capacity utilization of the beds, when it comes to children um, in acute burns coming into the hospital, was maybe we see them trickle in. But now I have about six beds. Averagely, I would say four. The, uh, the least bed occupancy that we have is like four. Mm -hmm. At least four beds are occupied at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a good one. That is a good one. So apart from the education, the we have up to about 60 percent, uh, 60 to 70 uh, percent bed occupancy. With that's that's a very significant improvement, and we intend to do more. Though we don't have uh, that uh, space now. Also, we will say by working with Children Bones Foundation we've been able to do more complex reconstruction for burns that survive, but with very severe deformity, not the kind of deformity you see in advanced country, but deformity that are actually very bad, that they have to, um, sometimes the parent have to send the child out of the house because the child look really gory mm -hmm. to visitors that comes uh, to visit. Some cases, I'll give you an example of some cases. I've treated a child that was abandoned in, um, in that is the parent sent this child out of the house and she was within the forest um, around that same village and she was raped multiple times. She got pregnant at 15. It was when she was uh, put into bed, somebody rescued her and brought her to the hospital from the forest. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, somebody told them that they could reach me for treatment. Mm -hmm. And they were able to bring the girl into the hospital. And after all the resuscitation from birth and everything, she had terrible contracture of the neck with the uh, upper limb also joined with it. We have to do the surgery. It was really a very, very stressful surgery for the girl. Mm -hmm. It took hours and multiple surgery at that to really solve this girl's problem. And after then, um, I think um, we introduced her into a trade where she will get some credit for palm oil and she's able to take them to the market and sell and make some profit to take care of the little baby. And we were also able to reach out to the parent that we've already reconstructed this girl and she can come back to the house, let them give her that love and support mm -hmm. and sending her out of the house has cost us so much, so much. But this is the time that this child needs that social and psychological support and we're able to reconcile the girl with the parent. And um, that was it. So uh, we've been able to, um, I would say, create um, a scenario where we unite the family. I'll give you another example. There was a girl called Tiwa, and the case was in court. 
Now, somebody that was making a barbecue and the girl strolled into the place and he didn't know. He just threw the charcoal, I mean, the fire, I mean, a naked fire or something like that. Yeah. Poured on this girl on her face and damaged um, the face so badly. And the parents took to different hospitals. You know, they were not very rich. Mm -hmm. um, they took to local hospitals, different hospitals. Those ones did what they could do mm -hmm. until they got a plastic surgeon who also attempted. But I think they wrote to Children Bones Foundation and Children Bones Foundation linked me and like, if I can do the work and make sure that this girl is uh, looking better to go into the society. And we brought in this uh, young girl, her name is Tiwa, and uh, did uh, multiple surgery to reconstruct the face. And by the time we finished, uh, the parents were like, wow, this is wonderful. Uh, I think we can get the case out of the court. I think we could forgive because we have to reconcile yeah. this man with that family. So they settled the dispute out of court because Children Bones Foundation was able to like come in with the finances and we, the doctors, the nurses, the team were able to reconstruct the parent where we us. when they see some part of the face that are not okay, we we'll say, okay, don't worry, we handle it, we do it, we rearrange, that is uh, do uh, scar revisions and multiple surgeries to make sure that the face is okay. And it was really acceptable to the parents and uh, the hand was rehabilitated. We call in um, a phys uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapist to come in and see what was able to write with the hand again and all. So that settled that dispute. It, mm -hmm. it was like magic when we finished, when we asked the parent, why are you still holding on this uh, people? You've been helped. So many things has happened. They said, no, 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 no. We're not going to court anymore. I think the man is free to go. I think our, ch our child look very okay. Mm -hmm. And is and he's ready to go to school, ready to do uh, great things in life. So the man can go. So we've set to dispute like that. We find victims like uh, uh, Chinaza, who is orphaned. No father, no mother. She was born before the, mother, the parent died. But after her born, two years on, at interval, the father died. We met Chinaza when the mother was still alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, through Children's Bones Foundation, we brought her in. She was walking around the street with a lot that is open wound with infection with a lot of pus dropping as she goes along the way. You can imagine a child going through this for two years. She became a paria, nobody coming close to her and we're able to pick the girl. And yes, those who offered to help before then said, except the parents agree to amputation of that right, low, uh, uh, right upper limb. And by the time it met us, and we discussed the case in Children's Bones Foundation. I offered that I don't think this hand will require any amputation, that we could salvage the hand, mm -hmm. and we salvage the hand. Um, Chinasa spent about one year with us uh, with multiple surgery, the hand salvaged, and that was she came to us when she was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Now she's about 17. She has finished her secondary school. She came out with the best of grade, the average um, score she had in the West African examination council exam that is written wow. by all the way in West Africa. She had an average of 80 in each of the wow. subjects. And she did this exam with that same hand mm -hmm. that was meant to be amputated. Uh -huh. That is uh -huh. a miracle. She's yeah. one of the most brilliant girls that, I, I mean, brilliant child of ever treated and she's interested in becoming a doctor and I am ready to support her. I've told her, look, just go for it. You can be the best you can be. And that is it. And she's interested in even being a born, a born surgeon. <laughs> that is great also. So this yeah. is some of the accomplishments that just helping those children could mm -hmm. achieve.
This, uh, yeah. this, that is the goal. That is what it is. If we leave this girl, probably she would have died of a sepsis or mm -hmm. probably would, would have had an amputation mm -hmm. or would not be able to reach her goal or psychologically down. When you're talking to Chinasa now, she's up, she's not her skin, mm -hmm. she's herself. Mm -hmm. And she's confident to face the world. Yes. Yeah. Those are the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We can talk about monarchy. Monarchy is still with me. This child lost everybody in the family except the mother. And because the mother, when there was that gas explosion that destroyed their home, mm -hmm. um, the mother went to get something. So Chinaza lost the siblings, the father, and the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And that bond. And she is the only surviving child of the mother now. Mm -hmm. And we know that if we lose Chinasa, the damage that that will cause to our mother will be very, very devastating. You know what it is for someone to lose every member of our family? That was not um, something that we also are uh, able to take. And we brought, yes, we brought them in, in critical state, and we lost the father, the child, the mother, around about the same day, I mean, within 24 hours, but uh, China Sao had about 60% burn, was being resuscitated, every effort was put on him. I remember then for almost a week, nobody was going home, you understand? Just because we wanted to do this for the mother. Uh, after the resuscitation, we did all the ex uh, burn excisions, and we started reconstructing. We had a lot of problem with uh, uh, this child that I have to just be networking with so many surgeons all across the world to like, come give me support and mm -hmm. tell me, have you ever had this experience before? This, what did you do in all? We are happy today that this boy is, is good to go. We're just about 8% of the uh, uh, bone wounds still remaining, which we hope to take care of within the next uh, uh, few few weeks, so that she can go home. We hope that she will be able to go home for Christmas, and um, that is our aim. And we we pray God we um, yeah. achieve it. Yeah. And um, you find someone like Majesty. There's a boy called Majesty Bere. He walk by just limping, hopping from one place to the other. He had bones which was neglected and she has a contracture, that's a flexural contracture of one of the, of the uh, lower limbs at the knee. This boy hops about, in fact, they call him the hopping boy. And it's really a problem for him to go to school because of the stigmatization. And this boy is one of the very brilliant uh, um, child that I've ever seen. And um, through Children Bones Foundation, we were able to bring this child in. And um, <laughs> we use so many unconventional ways that is coming using the orthopedics. It was not just pure plastic surgery. Um, we had uh, the contractor was so bad that the tibia got fractured during our first attempt to release it. So we have to um, uh, call in the orthopedic surgeon who helped us with um, the elixir of technique, which we have to pass a lot of uh, wires and nails into the leg and started getting the contracture um, released just one millimeter per day. You can imagine the patients and uh, why the bone heals. And we're able to achieve it today. Uh, this boy, uh, Majesty, is walking with the two uh, the two legs, you understand? Okay. Walking on his feet and he's able to go back to school. Yes, with some help, I was able to pay some of his school fees for uh -huh. some time so okay. that he will go back to school and not miss um, so much. 
-hmm. Then we have uh, someone like um, um, Odinaka. Odinaka was seen by uh, a social media influencer. Mm -hmm. This person has a, a page on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. And this boy walked around the street with his head covered with a cloth. Oh, that is this the one you referred to as the ghost boy? The ghost? He's a boy. Uh-huh. Yes, like a ghost boy. Yeah, okay. yeah, like the ghost boy. So yes. he walk all about with that like a ghost. So people were like, oh, who is this boy that comes out like a ghost, go to get something, go back into the house? Just because the whole scalp is full of sores, infected wounds with very severe contracture of the neck, that is the mentum, the lower jaw was tightly healed and stamped to the chest. Mm -hmm. And this boy would not want to come out. He doesn't want anybody to see him. Now, if you remove that hood, people are going to definitely probably stone him or, mm -hmm. or the other things he observed. That is, he told us is that even the even flies, flies follows her everywhere she goes to. So until this social media influencer heard about um, him and was able to get this uh, boy to Children Bonds Foundation. Today, Odinaka is doing perfectly well. We're able to release the neck. We're able to make sure the wounds all over the head heal. So those who could graft, we grafted them. And today, is going. he has gone back to school and is doing uh, very well. So those are the success story. I would say, Children's mm -hmm. Bond Foundation has been able to achieve. We have a lot more, a mm -hmm. lot more uh, children who probably would have died of infection, or would have been so so stigmatized that even their psychological state can make them run mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I have a question for you. I, I... You've used the term constrictor, constrictor uh, a number of times. Yeah, and for people that don't understand uh, burn injuries, can you uh, uh, help us understand what that is when you say someone's chin is fused to their chest? Because it, it's hard for people to imagine what, what that is. Yeah, we call them contractures. 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 Now, what happens is when there is burn, in the mobile part of the body, mm -hmm. the part of the body that moves, maybe like the eyelids, mm -hmm. neck, the yep. neck, mm -hmm. the elbow, right, right, the fingers, mm -hmm. the hip, mm -hmm. the knee, even the ankle, all the joints. And when they heal, they heal with a fixed uh, uh, what will I put it? A fist that uh -huh. will restrict the movement of these joints. Uh -huh. Okay. That is what is called contraction. Sometimes you see the eye, um, the lead will turn inside out, and the patient is not able to close the eye. Okay. That's a contraction also. Sometimes you see the mouth will heal, mm -hmm. and it will become smaller. Hmm. That is what we call the microstomia that we heal, and the patient will not be open to, will not be able to open the mouth to feed properly. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Then also, even the nose can be so constricted that breathing becomes difficult through the nose, and the patient has to breathe through the mouth. Mm -hmm. okay. These are all contractures. So. If there's a restriction, the scar restricts those joints or the mobile parts of the body, they are called contraction. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting. It, you, you shared some cases with us and um, particularly some cases that stand out to you of, of, of children that you've, you've helped along the way. Um, do, you, do you feel like they're... Could be a use 
here at the Children's Burn Foundation, we work a lot on prevention and education, um, trying to teach uh, families, children, how to stay safe. You had mentioned something earlier about um, some of the traditional treatment for uh, fever is to try to, to seat close to an open fire to, uh, to allow them to um, uh, hopefully get rid of the fever. But can you uh, can you share some stories of what happens to some children when that, that that's tried? You said something earlier today about uh, some people getting injured around open fire and that it happens more than once. Can you share that with people listening today? Yeah, uh, um, I think ignorance in Africa can be a problem, and because of some of the traditional practice that they've carried on. Mm -hmm. over the years, over many, many years. Like uh, when they have fever, you know, normally people get comfortable during, after the height of fever and when there is chills, when you sweat out, mm -hmm. you understand? Before the fever starts again. Yeah. Now, this people, the traditional method they used to quickly get that chills is to put the child close to the fire so that they can sweat out. Mm -hmm. And they feel the child becomes better at the height of fever if they can make, if, if, if the height of fever can quickly be reached and mm -hmm. the chills come. So, um, so when they notice that rigor, right they take the child to the fire and Sometimes the clothes that they used to cover the child mm -hmm. can get hot in the fire mm -hmm. and can burn the child. Sometimes some of these children are uh, suffer what is called febrile convulsion around this fire. And they fall face flat on the fire. We've treated about two cases like that. I have one with me now, Emanuela Collins. That was what happened to her. Her mom puts this uh, six-year-old girl close to the fire on a chair, covered her with cloth, and like, I'm coming, let me quickly pick something in the room mm -hmm. because the child has fever. And the child, develop uh, a seizure and fell face flat within the fire. Now, another thing, another practice that is really very dangerous is you find a child who is convulsing and during the uh, seizure episode, the their belief, their traditional belief is that when they put their hands or the feet in fire, that will resolve the seizure. So with Children's Burns Foundation, we've treated children who got their bones, bone injury through this process. So it was intentional, their parents put their feet in fire to stop the convulsion or to stop the, uh, depending on the language you use, whether it's convulsion or um, uh, uh, epilepsy or wound children with epilepsy are treated that way in mm -hmm. Africa. So those are another set um, ways that these children uh, get burned. So we've seen uh, cases like this. So the traditional practice really, really, really can be a problem. Then the pra traditional practice of how they cook. You know, in the developed world, most of the cooking top are high, mm -hmm. more on the table level. Mm -hmm. And the children who we call the two years were learning to crawl, uh -huh. restless, yeah. hugging on everything, and can just tug on anything, even the handle of the pot and pour yeah. the hot uh, sauce 
hot oil or water on their body. Mm -hmm. um, that is how it happens in most developed or the rich men's house. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in the poor setting, this fire are made on the ground and the pots are put there. Mm -hmm. The crawling child can just crawl into the fire. Right, right, right. So it is their cooking practice that would actually lead to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those things need to be changed. Then cooking in mothers are really wonderful, even in Africa. And remember the way we put um we 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 back the child. It's one one thing an African woman wants to do. That is backing the child. A lot of time they leave the child's hands free. And the mother could be cooking in the kitchen. And the child is fiddling away with things mm -hmm. as the mother walk around. I've seen a situation where the child picked the hot oil in the fry pan and poured it on the mother and, oh. and herself. Oh. Yeah. So uh, it's still the tradition, but this one's of course in home where they have the cooking uh, on the top. Mm -hmm. On the top. Then another way we get fires from is from petroleum. That is those bombs. Mm -hmm. Um Nigeria, if you notice what is happening in Nigeria and some West African countries now. You see, there's scarcity of petrol, petroleum product. That is, we are talking of gasoline. Mm -hmm. Now, for people to get gasoline, you have to queue for hours. So what happened? People go to the filling station, that's to the gas station, with jerry cans. And they buy this gas and keep in their home. Oh. Some in their bedroom. Right. What could possibly go wrong? Right. What? Yes. 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 Just strike a match. A mm -hmm. match. You know, if you look, you will not see anything, but you smell mm -hmm. the fume mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the gasoline in the room. It just take you striking a match, match and that yeah. is all. Yeah. But let me tell you something. One interesting thing, which could even happen in the United States of America, Mm -hmm. You keep gasoline very close to the house. You see, some babies, I've treated a baby who was put in a baby shrub that you used to cover the child when they are just born. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, during hamatan or dry season, you see this child moving, the newborn baby moving. Mm -hmm. And you notice that there is what is called electrostatic. Yes. Current, you feel, you see the, if yeah, you put off the light at night, yeah, yeah. you'll be seeing the sparks, mm -hmm. isn't it? Now, someone kept petroleum, I mean, that's gasoline, mm -hmm. in a bedroom and kept a baby covered with that baby uh, covering, and the baby was moving with. Mm -hmm some spark going on. Before you know it, the baby caught fire right on the bed. And their traditional belief was that what just happened, I think this is the work of the devil. And they took the child and started going from one traditional doctor to the other traditional doctor. It was when it was so bad that they brought this child to the hospital that why I was talking to them, I discovered that this trail was actually, I said, they should give me a replica of what they covered the child with. And I noticed that this is a kind of material, like a silky material that could actually ignite. Uh, direct spark, yeah. Because the direct spark and mm -hmm. complete the triangle. Mm -hmm. So, so many ways they come. But the traditional ones 
are getting their more from the very interior. The cooking on the ground, the child crawling to it, the traditional way they solve the fever, the traditional way they want to treat convulsion. You understand? These are um, what we see. Yeah. So I, I know uh, you're busy. I'm going to get you one, one more question here, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, are there specific resources or support from the Children's Burn Foundation that have been most beneficial to your efforts in terms of the work you do in uh, in Lagos, correct? Yeah, I, I work I work um, not in Lagos. Okay, I work in Edo State, the Niger Delta, and that is the where um, oil that is um, crude oil is being drilled. Uh huh. That is in Nigeria. Okay. And um, the in that same place, you see there's a lot of bunk, uh, oil bunkers, mm -hmm. bunkers mm -hmm. that try to drill a hole within the pipe and take the crude oil and cook the crude oil to make their own petroleum products. Yeah. So by so doing, adulterated petroleum products like kerosene, mm -hmm. adulterated kerosene mm -hmm. gets into the system. They are not well refined. Some mm -hmm. of them are still having those volatile uh, substance mm -hmm. in it. And at the end of the day, they can easily get exploded. So that is the kind of system I find myself, the mm -hmm. kind of environment Mm -hmm. um, I find myself now. I think your question is yeah, the, some of the resources and support. Like, what have been most beneficial that Children's Burn Foundation has been able to help you? What What is if there? If you had to say there are one or two things that we have been uh, most helpful in helping you, what would those things be? It could be literally the finances or the referrals or what would you say has been the most helpful to to the work you're doing. Well, I will look at this. Yes, the finances has really helped the children. I can tell you, um, like when I was discussing with some members of Children Bones Foundation, I say anytime we have one patient being sponsored by Children Bones Foundation, most other children with minor bones who comes are virtually treated free of free. Mm -hmm. because the things we got to help this child who is critically ill, we can take from them and use them to wrap these other children up and send them home. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to be admitted. Mm -hmm. So from the materials those children have, we are able to help like up to about five, six, seven other children who can be at home. Ah, uh huh. On, uh huh. On probably uh, every other day, or maybe we know that they are born, we heal within 14 days. Mm -hmm. So just follow up with them and they are okay. So, like I said, the number of children who walk into our hospital and the other partner in the hospital with us um, that we walk in and walk out without even paying um, a dime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can say we've got into about 50%. So I hope my own um, Prayer is that no child walk into the facility and have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. That is my hope. Mm -hmm. But we're taking care of those with minor burns now because of a lot of materials we have on ground mm -hmm. to make yeah. sure we wrap them up. Right. The remaining antibiotics that are maybe we bought for the children who are sponsored. Mm -hmm. we can use them to take care of the other uh, yeah. children 
who are who have minor bonds. Right. It's only when we have to admit to them that Children Bonds Foundation comes in and facilitates, but percentage that can go home, mm -hmm. even higher percentage that can be wrapped mm -hmm. and come from home. Um also we've been able to acquire uh products like EpiProtect that is really helping us to wrap those children and send them home. Mm -hmm. We send them home and by the time they are coming, maybe on the 10th day of burns, 10 to 14 days, if we make sure infection is controlled, the bone is already healed. And by the time we open the dressing, the epipotent starts cracking off and that is it, it's like magic. So with the help of Children Bones Foundation, we're confident to use this product, which are very expensive, very, very expensive. And with the help of Children Bones Foundation, we've been able to use in some occasion, uh, the fish skin. Ooh, I've heard a little bit about it. Yeah, that. the fish skin. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 even though it is in a rural area, mm -hmm. we've been able to use some advanced things mm -hmm. just because we have Children Bond Foundation backing us. That's terrific. But the most important thing is that those the Children Bond Foundation is in California, but the people they've been able to reach are those people who are totally hopeless. Mm. Totally hopeless. That is in the rural area where no, nobody want to go there. Mm -hmm. In fact, even the, 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 the fear of being kidnapped mm -hmm. we don't want you to, we don't make you want to go there. But we are able to get people out, give information out to people who are able to come out from there. That if you have this kind of children, please bring them out of that bring place them. to us. Yeah. And we will definitely do something for them. Yeah. And that is how we're spreading it. We've been able to make collaborations, even some children from other African countries have been flown into mm -hmm. those rural area and we tell them, we don't have the best of facilities. But what we can assure you is that we will do your reconstruction to the standard that will be internationally accepted mm -hmm. as long as we have that human resources to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing we can assure you of is that um, you will be properly taken care of in an environment that looks like your environment people you could interact with. You could you could freely go and buy your kind of food. Yeah. What you eat, what the child likes, yeah. what the child was uh, grew up with. Mm -hmm. So in that environment, that is a, a massive uh, plus mm -hmm. for, for us. So I would say in terms of financing, Children Bond Foundation has done so much, a lot. Then in terms of educating mm -hmm. those people, I've been able to get some resources, some ideas by interacting with uh, those who are drawing the program for children education and Children Bonds Foundation. And I'm able to replicate them. That means we go to school to schools I and mean, from school to schools to make sure that we teach them what it takes to prevent burn. So today we are also discussing how we can reach the pregnant women. And by the time I'm uh, probably by the end of this year or by January, I will make sure that we, I mean, we want to make sure that there will be a screen in the antenatal world that will show some of the um, resources, the videos uh, on burn prevention, mm -hmm. so that pregnant women will start learning how to take care of these children to reduce the number of uh, burns we are getting or the disfigurement from burns. Mm -hmm. So it's gradual, we're mm -hmm. getting there. Um, we've also, when it comes to learning, 
I think Children Bones Foundation has given us the wing to fly, mm -hmm. to do what um, could be done in a very advanced center, mm -hmm. even in our center. And that is, though we don't have all the technology, but paying attention to details, knowing that this is function and cosmetics. Like I told you, Chinas had the same hand that they say will not function is the same hand that she used to get our A's in the yeah. West African yeah. uh, examination council exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So function, then the cosmetic outlook is far better than when we started. Mm -hmm. because we are more confident to do that. Now, in future, what we want to do because is to lay that same, to increase that number of human resources. Mm -hmm. That is training more young people to be able to replicate this without all the high faluted um, uh, instrumentation mm -hmm. or being in a very big center. You understand? But yes. are able to, to craft those children in a, in, in, to the point that they will be acceptable socially in the society, to the point that they'll be useful again in the society. Mm -hmm. Nothing should impede them from using their hands and their legs, and nothing should impede them from facing the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is where we are going. And Children Bones Foundation has taken us about halfway. That's and terrific. we know we are going to reach there. That's terrific. You know, you had said, uh, you know, at Children's Burn Foundation, so many of our events are centered around the word hope. The word hope. And as you've said, we're helping to give hope to the hopeless, to, yeah. to people that are destitute and need the care and so I just want to thank you for taking time to, to talk to us and to our viewers. Um, your dedication and, and expertise, you know, supported by our partnership is really, it's inspiring. It really is. Um, to any of our viewers, uh, your support and, and contributions are vital to these efforts. Uh, together with the Children's Burn Foundation, we're making significant, uh, significant differences in healing, empowering, and providing hope to children and families in need. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. And if you wanna learn more about the Children's Burn Foundation, you can go to our website, which is www.childburn.org. That's childburn.org. Dr. Azezabor, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. And we look forward to continuing our partnership with you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night, everybody.